Next up, I gotta drill a slot all the way through this guy. And we're gonna start at 0 0.9875. And we're just gonna drill one right down the center. And that's it for the drill. Now we're just gonna clean out the slot. And I need to go 440 either side. Actually, 447, we're gonna clean up later. And then we're gonna clean out the tip. And we're gonna plunge. There we go. And we're gonna come straight back gently so that we don't accidentally break this when it gets stuck on chips like it is. All right. Now we're gonna come back up again and we're gonna go in and take off our, let's see, we're gonna do plus 32 and a half thousandths. We have to do plus or minus 32 and a half thousandths. All right, so we're done with the slot. Now we can turn this over and face off the top to remove that excess material. Then we can come in through the side and drill the hole for the pin that's gonna hold this bearing in place. And last but not least, we'll put this in the lathe and get that centered up and we will uh, bore a hole through for the ball bearing and the bronze sleeve. So when you're done, here's the material and you can see where I went all the way around it. Very nice finish. Finished five sides all at once. This side had a little bit of chatter. I should have taken a smaller bite. And I accidentally let the uh, collet touch there, so we need to fix that later, but uh, we'll come back and get that. So next we need to turn it over and remove all this excess material on the top and finish the part off. Putting the original Kurt Jaws back on, easy as pie. Don't have to open the vice jaws up hardly at all, which I really appreciate. I always throw some Vactra behind the vice jaws. I don't want any rust. So if I ever put any coolant or anything on here, I want to film the royal to keep the rust out. We're just going to remove about two tenths of an inch of material here, all the way across. a roughing end mill corn cob. All right, so next up we got to drill and ream the hole that's going to hold the pin for the bearing that sits back here. And I had to take the slot for the bearing farther forward just so that the edges, because it's square and obviously I was doing with a round hole. I mean, I could have used an eighth inch drill bit, but I don't think it's going to matter because I have that bronze bushing that will extend into that space and support the, the uh, ball bearing anyway. All right, so set up a quadrilateral target inside a four jaw chuck, but then set it up so it's centered. Uh, can be a bit of a challenge, but it's not too tricky. So what you do is you look for the low point on one side and then set a zero and then make the low point on the opposite side match. Now this, this is nine tenths in one direction and one inch in another direction. So it'll be a little bit off. 
but you, f you find the low point in one side, that's a tenth over, which is good because it's about a tenth, it's a little over a tenth actually, and make the other side match. And that's pretty much it. Um, but it takes a lot of back and forth, and since you're wiggling to find the low point, and you find the low point because it increases in either direction as you get off the center. So we're going to start with a center drill. Might be a bit high, it's fast. Well, I noticed after I drilled this hole that it's not centered and that's my complete screw up there. And I found out why, because, well, I made another fundamental error and I guess I have to make these so I can show you. That's the only reason I do it. I don't actually make these mistakes. But you need an indicator that has more than a tenth range if your part's uh, out by multiple tenths. And what happened was I lined it up perfectly a tenth off. <laughs> Because when you pull it out to flip it to the other side and let it back, you got to make sure that it comes not just to the same dial rotation point, but the small dial as well, which indicates full tense. So now we've got it centered. Fortunately, that was a small hole I drilled. So when I bore this out, I can fix my mistake. But boy, I almost blew the whole part right there. See if we can get a cleaner cut this time. I'm using a aluminum insert again because it's positive rake. Hopefully the interrupted cut on the other side is not going to totally screw me. But I want a smooth enough cut that I can actually measure this. I'm glad I caught this and I'm glad I didn't drill the big hole first. I almost went straight to a large silver and deming drill and uh, tried to ream it out because I have a three-quarter reamer. Boy, I would have been hosed then, huh? All right, so we have about five and a half thousandths left to do, and that'll put us a thousandth undersized. Just curious, once you start getting, this goes up to three-quarter, the next side's three-quarter down. They should have had them overlap. That wasn't very smart on their part. But once you start getting to the maximum extent of this thing, it becomes less and less accurate because it doesn't push in very much as you rotate. Oh, measures the same though, so that's very good. So we went two tenths over, not bad. Tell the bronze bushing start. I'm gonna put a tiny chamfer. So this bronze bushing is longer than I need. It's only supposed to be 0.4 inches, 0.4 something. Uh, so I'm gonna end up putting a pin and a bearing here, and I'm gonna push the bushing in till it's uh, just about right, and then I'm gonna face it off. So I gotta put it back in here, which will be fun, because uh, what one trick is you can just undo two of the jaws, and that'll get you close. And that's what we're gonna do. One annoying bit is this isn't hard material. This is just mild steel. And because I didn't have any like 4140 pre-hard anything like that, I should have used some brass spacers there to protect the face of this because the jaws just cut the heck out of this thing. And I had surface ground this just to clean it up because I didn't like the other turning uh, uh, marks in it. But you know, in reality, once I put this in the lathe holder, it's going to shred it anyways. I thought about cutting a recess in here for the marks of the lathe holder to be in their own space so it didn't look so bad. I might still do that. That would actually cover up some of those. But in any case, uh, let's assemble this guy. There's what the end looks like. And I got to deburr a couple things and uh, we should uh, be good for the next step. All right, we got this guy indicated back in. I've got the bearing in here. I've got the sleeve in as far as it needs to go. I'm just going to part off the excess and then we'll face it. If I get it in gear. We like it in gear. I'm going to keep this little bronze spacer here because I think that could be useful. Then I'm going to put a chamfer on the inside here just to make the ball bearing go in and out more easily. I was going to bore this out for a 5 8 inch ball bearing, but I decided not to. Uh, it's going to make it too little material 
you know so this could reach into smaller smaller areas it would be not a bad idea just to trim off all the way around and take off the corners on this i might do that of course it's going to get lots of chips near the ball bearing but i think i might do it anyways well we got this dialed in yet again this is going to make quite a noise Not as bad as I thought. Really surprising. Mild steel really is soft. All right, let's see what we got there. I think that'll let it reach in better. Well, that actually worked out pretty well. Yeah, I'm pleased with that. I need one more side project. So in order to center this guy height-wise, I need to make a point that'll fit in here. So that's a half-inch bore, a little bit over. Actually, it's like 0.501 or 502. And so I'm going to take this piece of brass and just make a point so I can set the approximate height. It doesn't have to be perfect. We want it to be close. I'm using brass because rather than set my compound an angle to cut the taper, I'm just going to use one of my uh, one of my form tools. So I made this guy such a slow, uh, close fit that I think I'm going to leave this little nub sticking out here. Otherwise. I may not be able to eject this out of here. Actually, it's going to be hard to eject no matter what. <laughs> it's a really close fit, but it'll definitely help me get my center. So it's time to use our burnishing tool. So I need to set the height because I have a uh, quick change tool post. So I need to set the height on the uh, new tool. And that's where this piece comes in. Set it using my height gauge that I've shown in another video. People have a lot of opinions about that. I find it extremely handy. I've been using it for many years now and I really like it and uh, whoops just stick the ball bearing in i thought maybe it might be nice to have a magnet come from the side just to make sure the ball bearing doesn't fall out but uh, it normally uh, stays okay once you get going all right so next we need to prep some pieces i've got several bits of material here and we're going to do some tests one of the things i'm doing to prep all of these pieces for test is i'm center drilling them because they're going to need to be supported by a live center because there's going to be a lot of lateral force on these parts. I'm also trying not to pick long parts because I don't want them to deflect in the middle. All right, here's what we're going to do. I've got uh, some pieces of material here I'm going to test with the burnisher. We've got some 4140 that's not hard, it's annealed. Brass, I'm not sure which version of brass it is. It's the common one sold at Industrial Metal Supply. I forget the, the uh, type, uh, type it is. Uh, I've got some 304 stainless, some 303 stainless, some cold rolled, and some 6061 aluminum. And take the diameter before, take the diameter after, the hardness before, or in a non-burnished part, and the hardness in a burnished spot, and see what happens. Let's take a look. One thing I am doing is I am cutting this with a pretty fast feed rate. This is some 6061 aluminum, and that stuff, it just turns like a dream anyways. If I did a slow feed, I could get almost a mirror finish on this, but I've got like a 14,000th of revolution uh, feed rate on this so that uh, you can feel the texture with my hand because I wanted to see if I could improve that a little bit. What I'm hoping is the burnisher is just going to sort of smooth over a whole section. So we're going to start burnishing some aluminum. So first we've got to measure diameter before, make a note. I'm taking in a couple spots because I want to be able to reproduce this. 0.9928 at the end here. And yes, I am measuring in tenths only because I think the burnisher is not going to affect the diameter that much because after all, how far can you squeeze the material in? So I've already centered the burnishing tool. I need my ball bearing, wherever that may be. Here we go. Stick it in. Of 
I'm going to start right on the end. I'm going to work over, I don't know, half an inch. I'm going to go back and forth four times on each sample. And uh, we're going to keep some lube on it. And uh, just to make this fast, I'm going to keep the RPM up. I'm going to slow the feed rate down to minimum. Okay. There we go. And we'll come back. And each time I'll try and tighten in a little bit more. And on the last pass, we'll try and come right off the edge. And we're there. All righty. So there is a definite appearance difference in the material. And I can definitely feel a ridge between the section that hasn't been burnished and the section that is. Although it seems like it's more going this direction when I go this direction. So basically it's turned up a burr there. That's what it's done. Squeeze some material ahead of it. Because I feel a my fingernail catches that direction, and I also feel it that direction. So yeah, there's a some material that's been kicked up. So let's take a look at the diameter. So very soft material, 0.9922. So six tenths uh, diameter decrease. One thing that kind of kind of suggests to me uh, an interesting use of this is if you get a finish pass using, you know, taking like a thousandth finish pass where you get a horrible finish quite often, and use the burnisher to improve that finish, you're not gonna change diameters a whole lot. All right, let's move on to our next material. You can see a dramatic difference in the surface finish. More difference on the 4140 than I thought, which is a low alloy steel.
Next up, we're going to measure the Rockwell B hardness of all these parts, which they're pretty soft. And I didn't leave a lot of material to do the harder side, or what I would expect to be the slightly harder side, but uh, we'll give it a shot. And that would be 21 for the aluminum in the non-burnished. Using the red scale. And that would be hardness 38. All right, so here's all my specimens. They went in order of aluminum, brass, cold rolled, 303, 304, and 4140. I'm sorry, 304 and 4140. Uh, so that's the order of what I did these in. So interestingly enough, uh, the material reduction diameter, they're not all the same diameter, so maybe this isn't a fair comparison, but 8 tenths for 4140, 6 tenths for brass, 4 tenths for 303, 5 tenths for 304, cold rolled was 7 tenths, and 60, 61 was 6 tenths. And that is measuring their diameter reduction of each one of those materials. Now, they're not all the same diameter, so this may not be a fair comparison, but the end result is it's less than a thousandth of material reduction diameter wise. So, if you have to take a final pass on some material and you leave a finish like this, which is really common for things like 4140 and cold roll, where they give you a crappy finish, if you leave a thousandth of material, you can run the burnishing tool across it, get a very nice finish, and uh, only, only lose a thousandth, actually less than a thousandth in each one of these cases. Now, hardness, that also was very interesting. 4140 went from 60 to 68 hardness on the Rockwell B scale. This is annealed. Uh, brass was from 34 to 52. Now, I didn't calibrate my hardness tester, so these are just relative measurements. So I don't know what 4140 is supposed to be in a kneeled state, but it went up six points relative to where it started. Uh, brass went up 18 points from where it started. Uh, this, is, this is 303, went up eight points. 304 only went up four points. Uh, 304 went up four points. Cold rolled went up one point. Didn't change hardly at all, but the surface finish sure did. Uh, aluminum went from 21 to 38, 17 points. So it looks like, much like ball peening, uh, burnishing increases surface hardness. And beside that, increases finish while not reducing diameter a whole lot. So I'd say that's a pretty handy tool for your arsenal. Here's a close-up look at the materials. Burnished, not burnished, burnished, not burnished, burnished, not burnished. Burnished, not burnished. Burnished, not burnished. Uh, burnished, not burnished. The aluminum burnished actually looks worse than the cut, but that's because you can get such a phenomenal finish with aluminum. It looks like a bit like ball peen, but it is very smooth to the fingernail test. Most of these feel like glass, everyone but the aluminum. The aluminum does not feel like glass. It feels like there's texture there, but less than the cut area. And that's it. Maybe you should consider making a burnishing tool for your arsenal. Seems like a really handy tool to have. Thanks for watching. Hope you find it useful. Hope to see you next time.